Thank you. You may be seated. It's again our privilege to have Brother Paul Durand with us tonight, and I believe we'll be preaching out of Ephesians, the belt of truth. Is that correct? So, uh, without further ado, Brother Paul. Good evening. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise him, O ye servants of the Lord, ye that stand in the house of the Lord in the courts of the house of our God. Bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Uh, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6 for a scripture reading. Ephesians 6 beginning with verse 11. Thank you for your encouragement. Although I know you come for the Lord, but uh, it's encouraging to see you all again who are present. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6. Let's give our attention to God's word, beginning with verse 10. The Holy Spirit gives his infallible word, or gave the infallible, inerrant word of God through the Apostle Paul. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand, to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. <clears throat> Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we look to Thee again for the supply of Thy Holy Spirit, the anointing of Thy Spirit upon this preaching of Thy holy truth and application and our meditation upon Thy Word and Thy commandments. Lord, thank You for Your holy and precious Word. We pray that Thou wouldst feed us with the living bread and cause us to look to Christ, Lord. Enable us by Your grace to gird our loins about with truth, Lord, to love truth, to seek truth, to be those that meditate upon truth and live our life not on the basis of the many lies and errors that fill this world, that your enemies have <clears throat> spread throughout the world, but upon the basis of your shining and everlasting truth. Thank you for your holy and precious word which frees us from the shackles of sin, which frees us from the errors that would destroy the soul, which teaches us that we might not remain in ignorance and death. Thank you for your truth, which frees us from slavery to men. Thank you, Father, that we have your written word 
that it is inspired, infallible, holy, and preserved, Father, that we have it before us. We have it in our homes to read and treasure and cherish. And by your grace, we have it in our hearts. Teach us to memorize it. And Lord, bring it to our minds every day <clears throat> that we might be led by thy spirit and led by thy truth. Help us to understand more and more in, in all our life, in our daily walk, uh, and, and the, the truth and reality about different things, Father. Um, even things outside your word. May, may we be seekers of truth, Lord, and please lead us and guide us. Give us the helps we need. But now we pray that thou wouldst open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Father, that thou wouldst give us understanding, that thou wouldst quicken us, Father, that we may uh, be bold as lions, Father, to be making thy truth known in this dark world. Thank you for the light of Christ that lives within your church, lives within our hearts, and by the truth uh, shines brightly in this dark world. We pray that thou wouldst equip us that we may be faithful even unto death. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. My text is in verse 14. Stand, therefore, <clears throat> having your loins girt about with truth. <clears throat> Where are your loins? Well, we would probably say hips or something along that line. Your waist. The belt of truth we are to put on so that we may stand. Have you ever seen battles depicted? Photos? I don't think you see too many people sitting down. I mean, they're standing. <coughs> Most states in our country, whether we agree with it or not, uh, as we drive along the road and enter a new state, there's a sign oftentimes that says, Fasten your seatbelt. It's our state law. Most states require the fastening of the seatbelts, right? For what? Presumably for our safety. Or for the safety of others. I suppose if we're a projectile out the front window in an accident, we might land on somebody and hurt them. No. God, though, here, much more importantly, commands us of course, we wouldn't fare too well in that situation. Sadly, we had uh, someone we knew knew that uh, was not wearing a safety belt and uh, had great trouble because of that. But this is much more important what we're dealing with here in the scriptures. God commands us to put on the belt of truth for the salvation of our souls and so that we can stand in the battle. We can't be saved without truth. But then also we can't live the life of a Christian very well, continue consistently serving God and doing his will without truth. Now we are not justified before God in any way by our actions or our works. So let's make that clear. God's not telling us to do something to be saved uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a way of justification like we would be right with God because of our works. No. <coughs> we are only justified before God by the righteousness of Christ. His perfect obedience, praise God, that is now ours through faith in Him, freely given to us as God has given us faith in Christ. We are justified from all things by Him and by His death on the cross paying that penalty which we could not have paid. The infinite Son of God, placing himself as our substitute on the cross, so that we might have life eternal and blessings of God innumerable, be filled with his Spirit, be transformed, and even ultimately be changed into the likeness of God's dear Son. Be in his heavenly kingdom and, oh, we could go on for a long time about all the blessings of being a Christian. <clears throat> we are justified by his righteousness, which includes his obedience and his death in our place for sin. 
for our sin. But the Lord does use his commands, such as this one, Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. <coughs> God uses his commands, which the New Testament is full of. I haven't checked it out myself, but uh, I have uh, <coughs> seen it, heard, read it, that there are more, new, more commandments in the New Testament than in even, even in the Old. The Old is three quarters or three times the size of the New Testament. But there are a tremendous amount of commandments in the New Testament. And also, uh, many times the commands of the Old Testament are repeated, uh, repeated, reiterated, and uh, quoted in the New. Uh, plus, in all the exposition, we have all these commandments that the Holy Spirit gives us directly through the apostles and writers of the New Testament. <clears throat> and the Lord uses these commands to lead us to that which will enable us to be victorious as Christians. How many of us want to be a uh, feeble or seemingly defeated Christian. I don't think any of us wants to be that way. And uh, Charles Bridges, in one of his commentaries, I think it was in Ecclesiastes, he mentioned how, on Ecclesiastes, he mentioned how, you know, really the, the discouraged Christian is, a, is, is not a good testimony. We ought to be rejoicing. We've got to get refocused. We've got to look at Christ. And that will encourage us. He died. He suffered terribly. <coughs> but then in the wonderful victory that God gave him, he rose from the dead and he lives forever. And is at the right, sand, high, uh, right hand of God on high. And he is our Savior. And he is victorious and triumphed over death and sin and hell for us. And so has become our Savior. He is our captain. Charles Spurgeon said, for every time we look at ourselves, we should look at Christ a thousand times. We see our sin when we look at ourselves. What's the solution to that? we got to look at Christ. He died for me. He paid for my sin. His righteousness is perfect. I am accepted in the Beloved before the living God. And I should be happy. we got to learn to rejoice in tribulation. I know I struggle with it. Sometimes I don't do too well in, in tribulation. Confess that. But may God help us, each one, to rejoice as the Apostle Paul did, even in tribulation. And God teaches us that way. Well, back to the point here. We are in a tremendous battle. This whole context of the, putting on the whole armor of God right, speaks to us that we are in a holy war and that we are in a battle. We've kind of had almost a theme of this here during this missionary conference. And the more and better we serve Christ, the fact is, the more and better we serve Christ, by better I mean according to his word, <coughs> the more we shall be persecuted by the world and the devil. In fact, if you look at the history of the world, uh, many times the persecution even comes from religious people. The greatest persecutions. But the world is busy and interested in persecuting Christians as well. The more and better we serve Christ, the more we shall be persecuted. And the word persecute, which appears sometimes in the New Testament, uh, has that idea of someone pursuing you. Pursuing you. The devil pursues. He doesn't care about those people who are captives of his, already in prison and chains and sinning and doing his will all the time. I mean, maybe he cares a little bit, but he doesn't want any benefit from them. But he's very concerned about those of us who are serving Christ and interested in the progress of his kingdom and his truth and speaking to others about the Bible. And so he's going to persecute us. He's going to give us a hard time and try to keep us from, from uh, getting our act together and, and going forward. But our Savior is stronger. And even when things seem seem uh, to be going all downhill. When you look at history, that's one of the wonderful things about history and reading good uh, church history and otherwise. You know, by the way, I talked a little bit about home education. You know, one thing that's really missing in, in the schools, in the non-Christian schools, is church history. Who says that we shouldn't study her church history? Church history is important. But they're not teaching it in the schools generally. Um, anyway, one of the great things about history is that we can see over a, a large period of time how even 
when things go bad in one area, I think Robert E. Lee said something to this effect. If I may mention him up here, he was a great Christian general. Um, I think he said something to the effect that, that that encourages him to think back on how things sometimes have gone bad, and yet God in his sovereignty still works it for good. The South lost that war between the states, and yet, and it was very troublesome, very awful for the South. And they were greatly persecuted afterwards. And yet God uses all these things for good. And truth, in the end, will triumph. We're on the winning side, brethren. We should all be encouraged about that. <coughs> well, the more we're going to be persecuted, and we're in this battle and war, so the Lord commands us to gird ourselves with the belt of truth, to gird ourselves with truth. And we who believe will seek to obey this command and clothe ourselves with truth in every sphere, but especially with the truth of God, which God has given us in the Bible, in the Holy Scriptures. The devil's specialty is deceit. He's the father of lies. Not only does he fill the world with lies and errors, he also seeks to turn people against other people through lies. He'll lie to you about me and to me about you. Possibly in some cases. We've got to sort through these things and seek the truth in all situations and not by the deceits of Satan and even of his servants in the world, gossipers or, or what have you. So he not only fills the world with lies and errors, he also seeks to turn people against other people through lies. We must go after truth with all our powers. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Get the truth. In another place it says, get wisdom. With all you're getting, get wisdom. But in Proverbs 23, 23, it says, buy the truth. Now, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he gives the one parable in a very few short sentences in Matthew 13, I believe it is, where he talks about the man who sold everything, right, to buy this one pearl of great price. <coughs> well, that pearl of great price is Jesus, our Lord, and is the truth. You cannot separate truth from Jesus, just like you cannot separate justice and love from Jesus. God is all his attributes in his being wisdom, power, justice, holiness, goodness, truth. <clears throat> we must go after truth with all our powers. The Bible even indicates that we must love the truth. It speaks of, quote, them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 Them that perish because they received not the love of the truth. We must receive the love of the truth and we must love truth. We need more laborers. <clears throat> We've talked about this a little bit. The Lord tells us, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he may send forth laborers into his harvest. We may be all apathetic. We may be struggling, persecuted, down, or whatever. But God is not troubled. He's on the throne, and when he wants to, he can raise up a laborer and send him forth to preach the gospel. A George Whitfield, or a Jonathan Edwards, or whoever he pleases. He can take the most humble among us. You know, we can never be proud about anything. Uh, in reality, as Paul says, we are what we are by the grace of God. What do we have that, no, that, we have, that God hasn't given us? If it's a good thing, the thing that we can really own is our own sin. Anything we do good comes from God. <clears throat> I tell uh, people sometimes uh, that may help you when you're missing a loved one. Uh, because uh, everything good that was in that loved one came from God. Christ. And that departure of the loved one can draw our heart closer to Christ, to God, as we think about that and how we have all that in Christ that we loved about the person because it was a reflection of Christ in that person. <clears throat> A 
Uh, we need more laborers. Pray to him, the Lord of the harvest, that he may send forth laborers. And as I mentioned this morning, that is the mo most we can do. Because God is the one that does that. Yet, we don't want just any laborers. We want laborers who are prepared, armed with the truth of God. We wouldn't send out a soldier without a weapon, without a tank, uh, if he was a, a tank driver, or whatever the situation was, the soldiers go with some weapons, at least a knife or something, <coughs> or in good health at least, to be able to punch the other guy. Right? And, uh, he has to have arms in order to fight the battle and we are to be armed with the truth of God so we must continually be putting the truth on and dressing ourselves clothing us ourselves with the whole armor of God to fight the battle that we have to fight daily the battle of love and being armed with the truth of God is to be armed with the true doctrine of God's word so therefore we want laborers that God would raise up who will be lovers of the truth who will study the truth who will preach the truth who will be faithful to God's word and that's what we need to pray for and also seek to equip. As part of our task as missionaries, go forth and teach others also. I, I mean, teach men that will be able to teach others also. That the truth of God may pass from one generation to another to another and the church progress and go on. And we need that most desperately in our country as well. So we need laborers who have their loins girt about with truth. <clears throat> now a couple things I want to point out. <coughs> Somehow on the computer everything came out with a one on it, but hopefully it'll work out anyway. This is the first piece of the whole armor of God. I think we can compare it to the fact that truth is foundational. We must know God's truth in order to believe it. As Paul says, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? You've got to know the truth. You've got to know about Jesus, hear about him, and your eyes open to the truth of the Bible in order to believe in the true Christ. You know, the Mormons believe in a Christ. Uh, the, uh, uh, what's the other cult? The Jehovah's Witnesses believe in a Christ, but they do not believe in the true Christ. We need to know the true Christ as he is revealed in the Bible, the one who is God, divine, and man, 100%, and was fitted with everything he needed to be our Redeemer, <coughs> our everlasting Redeemer. We must know God's truth in order to believe it, and we must believe it in order to be saved. The truth is foundational. You know, no building's going to do very well as the parable points out when the winds and the floods beat against the house that was built on the sand, what happened to that house? It fell down. But when the troubles come and a life is not grounded on Christ, the troubles are big. But when we are grounded on Christ, when He is our solid rock, and when we have the true Christ for our Savior, we believing the truth about Him and about God because we know what the Scripture teaches, through the grace of God, then we have a solid rock, we have a solid foundation for our Christian life and our life. The only thing worthy of the name life. Every building must have a solid foundation so that it may stand in the evil day. And that foundation is the true Christ, God our Savior. <clears throat> but how can one have the true Christ and the true God for his foundation? How do we know God? <coughs> we know God by means of his truth, of his self-revelation. Without the truth, we do not know him. Without the word of God, or that which is contained in the word of God, that which God has revealed in the world, you know, it can come to somebody by hearing, maybe a person that cannot read, doesn't have a Bible, but they hear the truth preached or spoken by means of God's truth a person can come to know 
God. He has revealed himself in his word in the Bible. Salvation is through faith in the truth. We must know God in order to believe him, know he is faithful and true, know something of his true characteristics, attributes, know Christ, that he, we may trust in him, know his work and its nature, that we may depend upon his righteousness and not seek to establish our own righteousness. As Paul talks about in Romans 10, the Jews sought to establish their own righteousness, but they didn't attain to it. Because there's only one righteousness of God, and that's the righteousness of Christ. And having that righteousness for our righteousness is the only way to be saved. We must know the truth and the true revelation of God about the way of salvation so that we may depend upon His righteousness alone. Beloved, seek knowledge. Seek knowledge in the Word of God. You must be reading God's Word. As the little chorus said, you know, read the Bible. Every day. Read the Bible, pray every day. <coughs> Let us seek knowledge in the Word. Second, it is the belt of truth. We're to gird our loins, our waist, with the belt, right? It enables one to stand. This is difficult when your breeches are falling down. And it enables one to walk and to run. It is even more difficult to run in such a condition. Truth is an essential for our necessary spiritual warfare. It's not a matter of we may or may not have to deal with spiritual battles. Well, that's life. We're always going to have spiritual battles as a Christian. We need the truth. We need to have it girding us making us able to stand in the evil day when Satan is attacking or when we're being fired at with lies. <clears throat> Whoever might go to war on mistaken grounds or believe falsehoods or errors, believing falsehoods or errors, is unlikely of success in that war or in that battle. Without the truth, a Christian is severely handicapped against the devil and all his wiles. He will be easy prey, for he has already one foot in the trap of lies. The belt fits one for fighting. In karate, they use the colored belts, you know, to signify different levels. It's associated with fighting. The black belt is the highest. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, Paul says at the beginning of this passage. Put on truth that we may be strong. Third, the Christian life is a battle. We've already mentioned that. but We are in a holy war. If you look at verse 12, he talks about this wrestling, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. You know, our real enemies are not our neighbors. We're to love our neighbors. But there are principalities and powers Satan, who is has them trapped and doing his will. Our battle is against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're in a holy war against principalities and powers in high places. We must stand. We must stand up, as the hymn says. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The devil's arms, his weapons are lies. <coughs> his chief weapons are lies. The only way to stand up is with truth. Second, we must fight. We must not be cowards. We must be brave and fight. There is no fight without purity of truth. As long as a few errors or lies can be tolerated, and we can sit down and relax with, with lies around, then... Um, the majority can be in harmonious agreement even with the devil. <clears throat> but we, brethren, don't have that option. We must contend for the truth and battle against all errors and lies. Anything that contradicts the word of God, which is the truth. 
So let us be students of the word, reading it all the time, meditating upon it. <clears throat> that we may be prepared to contend against every lie and every error. And dispel ignorance by proclaiming the truth. By trying to speak the truth in love and, and be faithful to be a witness for truth. <clears throat> Third, our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God. Prayer and truth. The proclamation and declaration of, of God's word, which includes what is sometimes known as the defense of the truth. It's our job to tear down error in contradistinction to the truth, by means of the truth. Truth shines more brightly when, when it's framed contrary to a certain error. The Westminster Confession of Faith sought to do that, and it's a very valuable uh, guide and help against errors because uh, so many things are framed in words that are specifically geared to counteract that error in church history, <coughs> which prevailed at one time or another in some quarter. Give falsehood no quarter. Contrast the error with the truth. And bring, we should, we should always, of course, by seeking to bring out of the word what, what is really in there through study, by what's called exegesis, not reading into the word what we think might be in there, but seeking to always get out of the word what is in there. For that reason, it's important when you're in school studying English grammar. So that helps you to read things correctly. And you may be a young person think, what can I do for Christ right now? Well, study. Learn well. Your lessons of English and other things that God will use in the future as you stand for truth and for God, Christ. <clears throat> Error must be exposed, contradicted, and destroyed by proclamation and faithful arguments from the word of God. Our God is a God of truth. He does not like to be misrepresented. It's a sin to misrepresent God, to say something that's not right about him. And may God help us to not do that when speaking of our Savior and our God. <clears throat> Moving on, this is a fight of love. It's kind of a strange fight in one way, but here in this battle, we are to fight a fight of love. We must speak the truth in love, says Paul in Ephesians 5, I believe it is. Out of God's love, with love towards our neighbors, in sweetness and kindness and mercy, yet with firmness. Standing firmly upon God's unchanging word. When you hear, maybe you're at the barber shop getting your hair cut, you hear somebody else say something that's untrue, you can ask God for grace and strength. Like Nehemiah prayed in the presence of the, the king. Right there. Before he asked him his request. We can pray for God to God to strengthen us and say something against that lie of Satan which was just repeated. As tactfully as we can, I suppose, in love but speaking the truth with firmness and standing firmly upon God's unchanging word. Christ the solid rock. <coughs> I think we mentioned this this morning too, but God loves through us to destroy the lies and errors of Satan which destroy the souls of men. In John 10, 10, Jesus said, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have more it might have it more abundantly. So what does the devil seek to do with his lies? He's trying to tear down souls. He's trying to maintain them in captivity. He's trying to discourage Christians like you and me. You and I. You grammarians can help me out later on that. Uh, he's trying to 
He is stealing and killing and destroying. But Jesus has come that we might have life. And remember that God uses the truth. No fight without the truth will issue in victory. The truth will win the victory. Therefore, we want to apply this in a few ways. Think upon the application of of this command in our lives to put on the belt of truth. Therefore, let us read the truth. Let us be continually reading God's word <coughs> and search out truth. It is absolutely necessary to be reading and digesting the scriptures every day. So personal devotions are of the utmost important that we ourselves individually be reading a portion at least a verse how can you say you don't have time to read one verse or a portion of a verse and think upon it a, a, a small moment before you go to work in the morning or if you're in a super hurry while you're eating breakfast <clears throat> reading the Bible but preferably more than just one verse. Daily and family devotions. We emphasize a lot in Chile, the necessity of it, but also here we want to emphasize how important and how much of a blessing it is when you as a family at home, if your husband won't do it, you do it as a wife, with your children, read the Bible every day and guide them in prayer. Guide them to pray to God and teach them to pray. You now the Lord has given us a prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, a model prayer. And because of the covenant promises of God, we can teach our children to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And we should read the Bible to them every day. What we do in our family, or try to do, is uh, have morning devotions in English every day and evening devotions in Spanish. That way, if we have a visitor in Chile, uh, then they're usually there in the evening and can join us for the Spanish family devotions. Uh, when we go to a, a prayer meeting, uh, uh, that becomes our evening exercises. But if we miss one or the other, then we're still having one time of family devotions, whether in the morning or the evening as a family, reading God's word. <coughs> and I would re recommend that practice. We need to think about what we read as well. Thought of the truth that we ingest that by reading is necessary. I'll talk a little bit more about meditation in a moment. It is vital to check Second, and take time to make sure we are believing and preaching the truth, that which God has actually revealed, therefore it's incumbent upon us to study. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must be diligent. We must study the word of God out. If you can, if you're young... Even if you're old, I knew one uh, man when I was in seminary at Faith, I think it was John Payne, he was about 70 years old and he was studying Hebrew. If you can, learn the original language. But study God's Word. Learn English well at least, or Spanish, <coughs> so you can read the Word of God with great profit. And dig deep. You know, I once uh, exposed the illustration of potatoes, how they grow near the, the surface of the ground, right? But you want diamonds, you've got to go way down. And we must dig deep into the Word of God that we might find precious gemstones of truth. Read good books as well. I think most good books are at least 130 years old. Uh, lists can help. There are some that were written in the 20th century, which are good. And 
I don't know about the 21st, but um, lists of recommended books can be very helpful in that regard. Perhaps you can ask your pastor to make you a list of some books that would be recommended. Or on a good website, find such a list. Uh, meditate, furthermore, upon the truth. Think about it and its implications for our lives. That's why I like and I recommend, you know, reading the Word of God in the morning. Because then as you're driving to work, you can be thinking about what you read. And God can use it in different instances through the day. We hear the Word of God preached on the first day of the week, and it helps us all week long. We can apply the same to our daily walk. Think about the truth that we read, that we, med that we find in the Bible, and meditate upon its implications for our lives. We can ask, ask ourselves questions like, what am I commanded in this scripture? What truth is God revealing? And, and various different questions that can help us to meditate and think it through. It's good to read a lot of the Bible, but it's also important to take a small portion and meditate upon it. We recommend very much memorizing God's Word. You will find it, if you haven't done too much and you start, you will find it to be a great blessing. It helps you to meditate upon it, like a cow chews the cud and chews and chews and chews and gets those nutrients out of the, out of the grass that he eats. Um, and the digestive juices work. As we turn the scriptures around in our mind, God can lead us uh, to understand it better and to apply it better in our lives. So it, we should memorize it, hide the word in our hearts that we might not sin against God, that we might do His will, and the way we might be ready in a situation where we have to make a decision and God can use His word that's in our hearts to guide us. <clears throat> then when you need it, God will bring it to mind. But don't expect to learn God's truth by Wi-Fi while the Bible sits on the shelf. I heard a preacher not too long ago. He said, if you don't like reading, repent. <coughs> Furthermore, always seek for the truth, for reality, with respect to anything which shall form the basis of any decision. Let's not make hasty decisions. One proverb says, uh, he, that, he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, to him it is folly. We must not rush to decisions without investigation and seeking for the truth upon which to make that decision. Uh, God's rule, quoted in 1 Timothy 5.19 from the Old Testament, for example, uh, it says, against an elder, receive not an accusation. Receive not an accusation against the servant of God, an elder in the church, but before two or three witnesses. So there must be an investigation of seeking for truth to make a de decision. And you must make judgments and decisions continually. Truth is necessary for making decisions. Don't believe everything you have been taught by men. Be an independent researcher. Be a skeptic, in that sense. <coughs> the scripture says, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5. It's one of the shortest verses um, in the Bible. It's among some others, like rejoice evermore. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So be seeker of the truth. Uh, for example, are GMOs good? Is fluoride really good? When you find out, let me know. I mean, these are questions where it's good to seek out the truth because it's not so plain and evident maybe and there's maybe a lot of lies put forth to support one position or another. But especially strive to be a good theologian. Yes, you. Every man is a theologian. You know, the world is full of theologians. Everybody believes something about God or about the reality 
of the world. The majority of the people in the world say they believe in a God of some sort. So they're a theologian of sort. Of sort. But of course everyone that, that believes the Bible is a theologian. But many theologians are terrible and many are very poor theologians. Each one of us has our own mindset of, of what God's word reveals and the truth of God that's in it. And we are theologians. We should seek to be a good theologian by studying the theology and the, uh, the truths and attributes of God and the truths of God that we find in the Bible and, and, and systematizing it for ourselves, understanding it, using helps that we can help find uh, to be faithful and good theologians with the truth of God filling our minds and hearts that we might be more of a blessing to others. The Bible is our source book. It's a big book. It's not that small of a book. Be a reader and a continual student of the book of books. If your time is short and you must neglect other books, fine. But don't neglect, never neglect the Word of God. We're going to be judged by the Word of God. <coughs> Furthermore, make truth known. Your neighbor needs to know and believe God's truth. Teach. Disciple. Be a truth teller. Be more of a blessing to others by communicating the truth that you know, that God has revealed to you, that's given you understanding of his word and of his Christ and of his salvation. And communicate the truth to others. Others. We're all called as Christians to make truth known and thus be a blessing to others. To speak the truth in love. Now it's very unfashionable. Relativism is very popular in this world and it's taught and promoted in the schools. And uh, the, the general idea they try to get everybody to think is that there are no absolutes. That this person can have their truth and that person can have their truth. And, and everybody can have their own truth and it doesn't matter that all these things contradict each other. It's truth for them. And what we believe is absolutely contrary to that because God believes that, I mean, God has revealed that He is truth, that there is only one truth, there is only one way to the Father, there is only one God, there is only one way of salvation, and God is an absolute God. And truth is absolute, not relativistic at all. It's very unfashionable today. However, Perhaps as a support, we can all use the idea and think about the fact that there is no comparison between today's so-called scholarship and the historic scholarship of God's servants in the past. There's no comparison between today's scholarship. You'd think we'd progress, but it's exactly the opposite. We've digressed tremendously. The United States was a strong nation, blessed by God because of the truth that we had when we were founded. A lot of truth and a lot of servants of God. Uh, I remember reading somewhere that the majority of soldiers in the war for independence were Presbyterians. On our side. <coughs> And truth bring, excuse me, truth did bring or brought uh, many blessings to our country. Christ was lifted up. The truth was proclaimed in the pulpits of this land. And we reaped many blessings. And even the non-Christians in our country have reaped many blessings through the scholarship and the true scholarship of the past, that which was faithful to the word of God. Some say Calvin, John Calvin, was the real founder of our country because so many things of what he preached and taught from the Word of God influenced our nation in its founding and the way it was set up. Not that we were perfectly set up by any means, but God was very gracious to the United States. The point is there's no comparison between today's scholarship and the historic scholarship of God's servants in the past, especially from the days of the Reformation in the 16th century, the 17th century, 
the 18th century, the 19th century, and then the 20th century saw a tremendous decline. First things began, you know, we're always going on. The mystery of iniquity was already working back in the days of the apostles, but of course things get worse. But sometimes they do get better, some situations. Let's never give up hope and look to Christ for revival. <clears throat> okay, just a couple more applications. Point out errors that truth may shine. People learn by contrast. As Pastor Mac Dr. McIntyre said, have no, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. The Lord calls, us to, upon, calls upon us to reprove error. These works may include, or these works, excuse me, include many lies in the world. Many awful books, many awful things published, whether in the newspapers or on the television or radio or various means, many things taught. We must reprove the lies which are taught and the lies that people believe. The truth may shine. Fight the battle with the truth. Being girded with the belt of truth, let us be every one of us here, theologians and warriors, fighting in the beauty parlor, in the barber shop, and wherever it may be that we are. <coughs> and lastly, love the truth. I say it again, because it is very important. You see the love of God's word over and over again in Psalm 119. Oh, how I delight in thy law. <clears throat> oh, I love thy truth, says the psalmist. Love the truth. Be not as them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Put the truth into practice and obey it. Let's all put on the belt of truth. Brethren, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for your word, which is as a light, a sure word of prophecy, a light shining in darkness, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, that we may not stumble. As your word says, the path of the just, the righteous in Christ, the servants of thee, our living God, the only true God, the path of the just shineth more and more as the day approaches. Father, we thank you that you are our light, your word is our light, you have given us understanding, uh, and Lord, you have guided us in the right way. We praise you and thank you for your holy word. May we love it. We pray that you give it each of us listening to this message each one, Father, that you would work by your grace because of the death of Christ, that it might please you to cause anyone outside of thee or many outside of thee to cry unto thee, be merciful to me, a sinner. I have believed the lies, Lord. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And that such a one would look to Christ, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life who said, No man cometh to the Father but by me. Thank you that we have a new and living way to come into the Holy of Holies by Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word which has revealed the gospel, the apostles' doctrine with which we have fellowship even now through their writings. Thank you for the Bibles we have. Many don't have that privilege or have not had it in the world. <clears throat> May we love and cherish your word. May we read it faithfully, meditate upon it, and grow in grace that we may serve thee acceptably in godly fear. Forgive us of our sins, Father. Strengthen us. Embolden us. Help us, Lord, for we are needy. And, Lord, we are weak, but you are strong. And we ask your blessing. You're lifting up, building up, encouraging and blessing your church, your witness here in Collingswood and, and everywhere uh, that we serve you. Help us all to put on and live your truth in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.